Just a couple weeks ago, I was here uh, giving a sermon on uh, the parable of the sower. Did everybody hear me? Is the mic working there? Let's see. Is this better? Much better. <laughs> All right, good morning. Uh, I was here just a couple of weeks ago uh, teaching, um, and I was teaching from the book of Job. Um, and I shared this exact same sermon in a, one of the school chapels. And when I went back to that <coughs> chapel this week, the uh, students told me that uh, they remembered a video that I showed them. Now, I didn't show you guys the video, but I showed our youth group. And the video was really impactful. It showed a man in a sailboat who was in the middle of the night just sleeping, and the boat starts sinking. And it suddenly is sinking in pitch blackness. He, he manages to get out of his boat into the raft and then realizes all of my survival gear is back in the sinking boat. So he goes back in there and he gets all of his gear. And, and, and he's on his way out and he cannot get out the door. There's a big wave that's come across and he's pinned in there. So you just feel this anxiety building. And, and I'm watching the kids' eyes as the video was going and they're just getting bigger and bigger. And then um, and then he finally gets out and he gets into his raft and, and this is the bad part. He still has 76 days on the sea before he's ever rescued and it just felt absolutely completely like Job. And the kids remembered the video. It's an amazing teaching tool. We remember these stories. And so Jesus taught his disciples. He taught the general audience of the public, the crowds that came around him. He taught them through these picture stories, right? Let me get my glasses out because I cannot see anything. <laughs> see, I can't even see where they're at. And uh, by the way, I am. I see a lot of a lot of faces out here that are are, are kind of new to us that I don't always see. So welcome, welcome to the Christian uh, Chinese Christian Alliance Church of Tampa Bay. It's a really long name, but it, it's a it's a really great church. So I'm glad you're here. Um, I was watching this, this video, uh, and, and the, the, the video series was about the mind, and, and this, this is going to really tie into what we're going to preach on today, which is the parable of the sower. Um, this, this, uh, this video series had basically talked about dreams, anxiety, it talked about worry, meditation as we meditate on the word, how drugs affect the mind, and also how the mind affects the body and the health of the body. And so it was a fascinating series, and I'm just, I'm just trying to learn more and more and more. And, and I know that I have got a lot of good students back here, and some of my students in the very back there. Um, some really good students in here, and so you're, you want to understand how the mind works, right? And uh, as a valedictorian of, of my class at, at Trinity, I really wanted to know how to, to get it even better. And so I studied things like how Ravi Zacharias studied. And, uh, and I figured if I could study the same way he did, I'd, I'd have really uh, a, a step above what's usually done, right? And, uh, but I was looking at this second video in the series called The Mind, and it was about memory. And what really struck me about that is it, it kind of was breaking down the process, how we memorize, and how we recall those memories. And, uh, and so it, it got into memorization champions. Has anybody ever seen anything on memorization champions? They're, they're absolutely fascinating. These guys, how they, how they remember things. Let's, let's bring up, um, do you have the slides? Let's bring up this first slide. See this, this slide of numbers here? Now, if I told you that you had to memorize every digit here in the correct and exact order in about five minutes, most of you wouldn't be able to do it. And, and, and most of us don't have a perfect photographic memory. We may, even those who have a photographic memory like myself, don't have an absolutely perfect one. And so something like this would be really difficult for most people, even those with a photographic memory. But I'm gonna teach you how you can actually memorize those. Let's go to the next slide. This is one that you guys probably recognize really, really well, right? You recognize this. These are emojis. And, and they, these little pictures uh, are what uh, a memorization champion is going to do. He's going to assign each one of those numbers to a picture, much like this. Now, if you looked at this uh, little uh, picture uh, scheme here and you went across the top from the left, you'd say, oh, this guy saw something, then he fell in love with it. His friend said, ugh. 
And, and then his other friend got just like violently sick from whatever he fell in love with, right? And so you can kind of make this little story out of these pictures. I just made that up, right? And so you, uh, as a memorization champion, would go ahead and you'd memorize those numbers based on pictures and you'd tell a little story, almost like you're going down a street. And you'd remember everything as you went along that street in that little story. And so that's how a memorization champion works with it. Let's go to the next slide. I'll show you a little bit more about what I mean. Okay. We all recognize this story, right? The three little pigs. Yep. So there's three little pigs. The first pig made his house out of straw, right? And the second made it out of wood. The third made it out of brick. And then a big bad wolf came along, started blowing down houses. How do I know those stories when there's absolutely no words, no text up here? Because I memorized a series of pictures, right? Our brains work that way. And Jesus knew that. He knew how our brains worked. If I said, uh, Mary had a little lamb, how'd you know that? All right, if I said, Old MacDonald had a farm, you knew that, right? It, it's ingrained in our memory. And, and so we're able to recall these little pieces uh, through this series of picture stories that you learned when you were little kids. And you might not realize that you're accessing those pictures to, to get to that story. And so... Um, there is, there is a, uh, a way that, that, that Jesus used to tie these, uh, what it, you'd say, familiar type things to teach the unfamiliar spiritual things. Does that make sense? Is that for me? All right. So in his society, there was a, it was an agricultural society. So farmers and crops were, were pretty common herding very common things. These were the things that you would talk to them about. Now, how many people in here are, are farmers? Well, we got a couple hands, right? So a couple of you would understand if, I, if, if Jesus was speaking on the street in front of you, but the, the vast majority of you guys, we need to talk to about smartphones or traffic or coming to church on Sunday morning. And then we run a parallel to spiritual things and you could begin to understand them through that story of the common to us. And so Jesus did the same thing with the, uh, the parable of the sower. And so Jesus was, uh, was teaching, and he's not teaching indoors like we are right now. This is a, a, a very controlled environment. You've got pretty much mostly Christians in here. You've got a air conditioning. You've got a closed-in room, ideal lighting. There's no background noises. Everything's ideal. But Jesus' teaching wasn't like that. It was a very, dis very distracted crowd, lots of noises. It's in the open street. And he's teaching those people who have eyes to see. But he's also teaching those people whose ears and eyes are closed. Those people who would oppose him. So he's got to captivate his audience for the people who would believe and understand. But he's also got to be very, very careful to avoid creating a scene, a controversy in the middle of the street because his time had not yet come. So as he taught, he taught about truths, truths that you'd understand. Like for instance, if you're planting and you're a farmer, you know that that seed is gonna need some soil, right? It's also gonna need some fertilizer. It's gonna need water. It's gonna need light. And it's also gonna need a right amount of shade. And it's gonna need all of this in, a, in perfect balance. So these were all things that he would be talking to them about that they would know and they would understand. They were the familiar that he would parallel with the unfamiliar. Now, if you think about parables, they're almost like a chocolate-covered pill. Think about that, chocolate-covered pill. Once you put chocolate on there, you can pretty much take just about anything down, right? That, 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 that uh, chocolate is just so good and, it, and, it, and you just want to swallow that truth, right? And so, um, as he was teaching, it's much easier than, than first bringing offense and confronting and people are yelling, right? So he had method to what he was doing. And so the, the last part of his ministry was almost all parables in the streets for this reason. And so parables are short illustrative stories that teach a truth. Now, they're, they're wise sayings, they're not written. So a lot of times we take for granted that we look in the Bible and we find the parable of the sower and it's in words and it's written and we can study it. But in the street, it was, it was being said, it wasn't written. And so he was telling the story so that we can get to the point of the story so that you can understand it. So parables, you don't wanna get lost in the details. 
you want to get the main point. Does that make sense? All right, so that's what he was trying to get them to, is that main point, that spiritual point. Now, the audience was listening and absorbing the truths of the story, and then he brought in the ultimate truth, the ultimate truth being the Word of God. So and when we see a story like the parable of the sower or any other story, we've got to ask ourselves a couple of questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how, so that we can understand that story, right? So in this parable of the sower, you see a farmer, right? There's a farmer there. And what is he doing? He's sowing. What is sowing? Not, not stitching, right? Sowing is planting. So he's planting. And then what is the time of the year? It doesn't matter. It's the same for all of the seeds, right? And it's the same for all the soil. And uh, where, where is he planting? He's planting in four different kinds of soil. And that is what is very important to understand. He is planting in four different kinds of soil. And he's planting with seed. And that's very important as well, as we'll find out soon. So same seed, same time of year, but different soils. Everybody got that? That's going to be really important as we go on, all right? All right, so he said, uh, let's go into uh, Mark 4, verses 1 through 9. Go ahead and bring open your Bibles. I have, I have the, uh, all four, I mean all three of the Gospels here um, in the story. Matthew uh, chapter 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. But we're going to be in Mark 4, verses 1 through 20 today. All right, as we start here, it says, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that, the, that he got into a boat and he sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. So we see it's Jesus talking and his audience is the crowd. He taught them many things by parables and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30 some 60, some 100 times that Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. He said, listen. How many people here don't listen well? You know, my wife always accuses me of having selective hearing when it comes to the trash or the dishes. Anybody else here like that? Okay, yes. times, yes. Selective hearing is uh, sort of a protection in that regard. Uh, wow, that, that trash just went out by itself. Actually, it was my wife carried it out. Um, and so, so we need to actually listen better, right? We need to listen a lot better. And he wanted them to listen very carefully, but he wanted them to listen with spiritual ears. He wanted them to see with spiritual eyes. He wanted them to be able to understand deeper things of God. And he wanted them to be able to discern the truths that lay within it. He didn't want them to be like they were hearing another story and just sort of hear the story and la la la, it was a great story and it just kind of passes on by. No, no, this was a story that needed to sink deep into their hearts. They need to understand this because they need to apply these truths to their life. This was going to be very important. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll have to... Um, I have to tell you, sometimes when I go to church uh, and and uh, and then I get home and I'll ask my I'll ask my daughter what what uh, service was about, or I'll ask somebody else in here what what service was about because maybe I was I was I was serving somewhere else and and uh, and I'll say okay what was the service about and they go it was it was you know it was really good and it was about Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you guys caught it, didn't you? They weren't paying attention at all, were they? They were not listening, but it was a good answer, right? That's, that's what happens when you're in the back sleeping or whatever. You wake up and you're like, hey, man. Yeah, it was about Jesus today, right? And, and usually you're pretty correct, right? But a lot of us don't listen well. And we really need to listen well to what is, is being taught in the Bible and to in Jesus' truths. So in, uh, let's turn to Matthew 13.10. Have you guys got that there? Matthew 13.10. We're going back and forth between the, the, the three different... 
uh, versions of the story. Now they're, they're all very, very similar. There's only uh, very slight variances that would be the differences based on who's telling the story, but very, very similar. All right, in Matthew 13, 10, the disciples asked, uh, why do you speak to the people in parables? And Jesus replied in verse 11, the secrets of God have been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seen, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus says, listen, it's important. Pay attention. Uh, don't miss this. The seed is the word of God. And the word of God, God's truth, the seed takes root where? In our hearts. Right? It takes root in our hearts. Different types of soil in all of our heart conditions. Different conditions and how your heart reacts to that seed is going to determine how that seed is going to grow. That makes sense? <coughs> so, in uh, Mark 4, verse 13, Jesus said to the disciples, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? What is he saying there? What do you think Jesus is saying? He's not really picking on them. He's trying to kind of wake up their intellect, right? He's saying... Be spiritually minded. Don't just think from the surface story. Think deeper than that. When you walk out and about in Tampa Bay area, do you think from spiritual eyes as you see other people? Do you see them as your brothers and sisters? Do you see issues from a spiritual nature? Or are you just swept along in the controversy that sells today? Right? Are you seeing it from spiritual eyes? Are you discerning for truths or just absorbing everything that you hear? Right? We have this wonderful filter for our brains that's called the Bible, right? And if you don't have that seed in you, you'll pretty much accept any seed, right? Because you, you have that, that hole where you need to have truth. <coughs> so listen careful to, to me. Sowers must be farmers. In other words, they must be believers. And believers cannot sow a crop if they lack seed. They must be in the seed which is the word of God. Commentator David Guzik states, the same sun that softens wax hardens clay. The condition of our hearts either softens to accept or hardens to reject God's word. Then the sower must go to the storehouse, the Bible, and then first consume the seed themselves. Then he's able to sow the seed in others and become a producer. Does that make sense? All right, so let's let's continue as we, we go down to the 14th verse here in Mark 4. Jesus explains the parable. He says, the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seed are sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Okay, so we see four types of soil here, four different conditions of the heart. The first is along the path. And I want you to imagine this, this aisle here in the church, right? If you imagine this path in the church, if I sprinkle seeds in this path, all of you came in here today, a lot of those seeds wouldn't be, would not grow anything after that. They'd be crushed. They'd be basically scattered by the birds, right? They, they would be uh, basically worth nothing. And the, the, the aisle there, the path in, in the first example, really, uh, it explains the busyness of our lives. The, uh, the word trampled is really rush, ambition, and pursuit, and attainment, and hurry. We're always so busy to get everywhere and to do everything. We need to slow down and listen to the word of God. Then the other one is a rocky place, right? 
if you imagine like this hard table over here or one of these chairs, right? That's a, a, that's a hard place, right? It's, it's not going to allow the, the roots to grow deep, is it? The roots are going to be growing in. If there's any, any dirt on that chair, it's just going to be shallow soil, right? And so when trouble comes along, persecution, issues in our lives, you're just going to abandon it as quick as anything because your roots weren't deep. You were living what I call the shallow life. Now, both of those didn't really have roots, right? Didn't have any significant roots. Now, the third and the fourth do have roots. The third is choked by thorns, right? It's choked by thorns, which I consider the culture. The culture that we live in here today, there, there is a deceitfulness of riches and, a, and attainment, power, authority, influence, all sorts of things. It's really a desire for other things. Have you ever seen sports athletes that said, once I got to that point, I got to that point I've been always dreamed of, dreaming about, that I got there and then it wasn't what I expected? It didn't fulfill me? Our, our dreams and, uh, and our desires often are like that. I, I, I know that I, I usually am about second place in a lot of these tournaments, sometimes third. And, but you know the US Olympic team guys, they, they usually will take that first place from me because they're so much faster. I just try to get a little closer to them every time. But one of the tournaments, I, I took first place. I took first place actually all three of these races that, that weekend. It was, it was a fantastic feeling of accomplishment, except at the moment I had to be there uh, accepting the trophy. It was less than I'd expected. It was less than fulfilling. I really enjoyed, I found, uh, just chasing the top guy and congratulating the top guy. And it felt really good. And the spotlight wasn't on me and all that. But when I was actually in first place, it didn't feel as good as you think it would. If uh, some of you compete, you probably understand exactly what I'm talking about. It doesn't feel anything like you think it's going to feel. Nancy Guthrie, the author of uh, The Wisdom of God, wrote a very, very interesting quote, a very interesting quote on ambition that I'd like to share with you guys. She says, ambitions drive men. They enslave them. They send them on. And then at last, hurl their victims down in disappointment. Human society has also arranged amusements in order to quiet the victim while death creeps nearer all the time. Ever thought of it that way? We spend so much time in amusements. We spend all this time in our, our smartphones, right? Some of you guys are laying in bed in your smartphones even. And, and our, our minds are just constantly in just being distracted. And Satan's like, yes, that's exactly what we need. We just need them distracted long enough to let a lifetime pass and not get it. That's, that's all that he's needing. Maybe serving wonderfully in a church, uh, doing lots of good things in your community, and you think that you're getting it, but you never got the seed. You never opened the storehouse, pulled out the seed, and spent the time in it. The fourth one here, actually before we get to the fourth one, in these amusements, they find that their hearts become calloused. They don't listen. They don't see, and they don't understand with their heart. Pride keeps them from turning, keeps them from repenting. And so God wants you to open up your eyes, open up your hearts, and see him as he really, truly is. So the good soil, it seeks to go deeper. It persists. It's not short-term, such as coming to Christ and then going, oh, I've got my ticket, I'm good. There's a whole lifetime. That's just the beginning. Now you begin sanctification. It's a process of moving to be more holy. Isn't that what we want to do with our lives? We want to be more holy. We want to ultimately glorify God by the way that we live, not just knowing who he is, but abiding in him, really understanding what he has for us. And in that, really understanding our purpose, the purpose for which we were created so that we may grow deep roots and grow up into what he originally designed us to be. Isn't that our goal? Yeah. Everybody say I'm in on that one, yeah. right? Yeah. Amen. Now, if somebody's teaching another seed other than the Word of God, don't, don't plant that seed, okay? Reject that seed. All right, let's, uh, let's turn to the slide here on Luke. 
815, good soil. Do you have that one? It uh, should be Luke 815. Oh, fuck. Oh, I think I meant to put Luke on that. Sorry. It's Luke 815. It says, but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Are you producing? That's a sign of whether it's really got roots, isn't it? If you're not producing, then you're still sitting there. That seed is still on hard ground or in shallow soil. Uh, or it's been choked out by the thorns, the thorns that you wanted to be like, the, the, the thorns that you ran along with in your life all the time. Instead, you need to be separate from the thorns, right? You need to run a different course, a course that a Christian would walk, right? That's our goal. If you're saved and the Holy Spirit is in you, you're going to be producing 30, 60, 100 times. You'll see that you will begin to create new believers and disciples. And those will be your crop that you need to tend. Now, if, if you get saved and, and you don't do anything about it, it's like a, it's like a field that's just sitting fallow. It's, it's sitting just bare. There's Nobody's watering it. Nobody's taking care of it. It's not going anywhere. Nobody's weeding it. And trust me, you're going to have to weed your life. There's a lot of things that will come in. You'll have to weed and so you're just sitting where you started. In fact, you become an adult infant spiritually. I mean, why is, it, why is it that we dedicate our lives to education? We start elementary, middle school, high school. Uh, you get your associate degree, your bachelor's, your master's. You go on to your doctorate. Some people have multiple doctorate degrees. We have gotten the knowledge so that we may be valuable to our employers. Why do we feel that we do not need to be valuable to God? That's, that should uh, definitely uh, make you think. As we spend all of that time learning all of those things for an earthly employer, yet do not take the same dedication to knowledge of the word so that we may glorify God. And so some of what we learn in school ends up used the wrong way because it's not guided with the right principles. So the seed takes root in our heart. And as I look around the room today, there's going to be a lot of different soil differences, aren't there? There's going to be a lot of people in this room that are going to be uh, good soil. Some people are going to be crowded by thorns. Some, that are, some are, are going to be on the hard, hard soil. Um, there's a lot of different things going on. And only you know where your heart is at today. And some, sometimes we, we've just been away from God for a while. We've just not taken the time. We've somehow gotten so distracted that we haven't been with him in a while. We haven't taken the time in prayer. We haven't taken the time in the word. We haven't really devoted like we would to our workout or to our studies or to anything else. And so God is patiently waiting, and he's sitting over there, and he's, he's waiting. He's waiting for you to get serious about him, because he's very serious about you. The entire word of God can be read very easily. Most of these books are very, very short. Most New Testament books don't take any time at all. They're very easy to read. And with translations that are very simple today, you can easily get through one of these. This is a uh, interlinear, uh, excuse me, interleafed Bible, and so it has an extra page in between. So you can imagine, most of your Bibles are about half this size, right? And so it's not that big a book. Yeah, we read books all the time. Why don't we open this one? You know, there's more of these sitting in houses, unread, than any other book. So in our busy culture, we're on our TV, we're on our video games, we're on our smartphones. How many people have been on smartphones here today already? All right. How many of y'all have been in the Word today outside of this one right now? Probably not as many, right? All right, so we need to check our priorities. What you spend your time doing, think about yesterday. What you spent your time doing 
was your priorities yesterday? And so you can look at every hour and go, did I have enough time to spend with God in one way or the other? Probably did. But uh, I spent, you know, a bunch of time uh, playing Fortnite or, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, or practicing the dances uh, or, uh, you know, watching TV. We all seem to have time for that, don't we? Um, you know, a lot of you guys spend a lot of time in Netflix. Raise your hand if you spend time in Netflix. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I love the documentaries and other things like that. That's where I found that, that uh, movie on, on, on uh, memory. And so we spend all this time doing a lot of different things, and some of them are really good things. You need to get some chores done. You need to get some work done. You need some time with friends. You need some time with family. But like your workout, you have to schedule it or it doesn't happen, right? You have to schedule it because it's a priority. It's a priority relationship. It's not a, 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 a duty that you just have to fulfill. I don't want you to feel that way. That's not, that's, it's not about re religiousness. It's uh, like I talked about with Joe, it's about relationship, right? It's about relationship, and he's waiting for a real relationship. If you don't have a real relationship, you really don't have anything. I, I've, I've known my, my, my friend Lance here, and he's, he's here with us today. And I've known him since kindergarten, since kindergarten, right? And we've had a long, long, long relationship. And what really defines relationships is experiences that we've had together, right? We've shared a lot of downs and ups and sideways. I mean, all sorts of things over the years, right? And as we've walked through life together, we've really, really learned to appreciate our differences and our similarities, all these different things that make each of us who we are. And, and that's what I want you to be able to feel with the Lord. I want you to be able to understand who he really is. To really have that relationship. To know what he wants and made you to do. Now, it's not too late. You might be, I don't know, like Moses, 80 years old. Or you might be a teenager right now. You might be sort of doing the obligatory thing, like mom and dad took me to church, so I'm here. Um, but I'd like you to have a different attitude about it, because God certainly has a different attitude about you. He wants you to get excited about him, really excited about him. He wants you to seek him, to pursue, the Bible says. We should flee from sin and pursue God. That is, that's an active, that's an active state. It doesn't just automatically happen to you. It's not like an escalator, an elevator, where you just kind of get on and it takes you there. Christianity, uh, although it's a noun, it should be a verb because it's something that you guys need to put into action. I need to put it into action every single day. And my wife can tell you sometimes I get really, really excited about the word. So I'll sit down to study the word. And I remember one day she, she came to me and, and, and uh, she says, she says, are you done yet? And, uh, and, I, and I said, no, I've only been here a half hour. She goes, you've been sitting there for like the last four or five hours. And it just gets so exciting. And, and that's how you'll feel if you get into God's word and you open it up and you sort of marinate it. You sit there and just really let it soak in. And you think about it deeply. What is that seed? What's, what, is, what are they really talking about here? Oh, that's the word of God. And so I'm, I've got to be planting that. And it's got to be producing. And it, what am I really doing? Am I, am I that producer or... Am I, am I just leaving it in the storehouse? Am I just knowing about it? Or am I actually tending that field daily? That's what you need to say. And each of you knows your own heart. So that's, that's kind of where we're, we're at today with here. So what uh, I want to uh, ask you guys is what kind of Christian soil are you? So everybody close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. I don't want anybody to open your eyes. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. And I, and I really want to see, you know, where you're at with it. Honestly, between you and the Lord, where are you at with it? Are you the first seed? Are you trampled through busyness and excuses? Raise your hand if you feel... Like, you're just kind of stuck there right now. If you're stuck there right now, go and see some hands there. That's honest. That's honest. You're being honest with yourself, and you're being honest with the Lord. That's humility. All right. Now, if you kind of feel like maybe you're on 
on shallow soil. Maybe you've been ignoring your walk a little bit, not growing, kind of sitting and idle. The engine's running, but it's not going anywhere. Just raise a hand. Be honest with yourself. Just be honest. Yeah, honest with the Lord. You can do something about that. You know, you can do something about that. First, first identify it and do something about it. Then if you've got seeds and they're growing roots, but you feel like you've been kind of running with everybody else, you're kind of following culture, you're kind of following ambition, and those roots are getting choked out by the culture, just raise a hand. Be honest. Yeah. See the hands. It's honest. That's that's a big that's a big part of just about everybody is just finding a way to not become part of the collective of, of everybody else. The Lord says, be separate, be separate, be different. You are different. Know that you're a child of God. And how many of you guys are, are feeling like that, that things are working out right now and you're on a good place? You're at a place in your life right now where you're you're growing a little bit and you're you're kind of happy about that. See some hands there too. That's good. So people are at a good point right now. I'm gonna give you a great big warning for those people that are in that position right now. It's so easy to fall out of that position. It is so easy to get choked out. It's so easy to just forget and, and, and ignore God. It, it is the most dangerous position. You need discipline, persistence. I'm going to try to encourage you guys. Continue to be good soil. And then the last question is, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all eyes, eyes closed. If, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you'd like to make that decision today, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right, I see these hands. I'm going to pray with you today. Lord, help us to be good soil. Lord, help us. Help us to find discipline, persistence. Help us to seek after you. Help us not to run with the culture, but to run to you. Lord, renew in me a, a clean heart. Renew in me a new focus. Help me to want to pursue you in the way that you're pursuing me. Lord, I know that you're my Lord and Savior. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And that for those who have not done it today, just, just pray along with me here. Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I recognize, I acknowledge that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. I recognize that my heart is sinful. I don't always do the things that I want to do. I don't always do the right things. But today I repent and I turn away from them. And I turn towards you, Lord. I turn towards your glory. I know you are our creator, our sustainer, our king, and our coming king. Lord, as our Redeemer, I know that you are capable of, of saving me from the sin that, that creeps into my life. And so, Lord, I ask that, that you come into my life, you change my heart, you change how I see, you change how I hear, and you change what I do, that I become a producer for you, that, that I glorify you through the things that I do, that your name may be glorified above all names. This thing is I pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I hope that many of you guys prayed that today. Either as a rededication or as for the very first time, that you may seek God in a large way. That today may be the next day towards the future of becoming no longer a spiritual child, but an adult spiritually. That you may glorify the King and serve your purpose in a mighty way. That you may glorify His name. Amen. Amen. Uh, youth group, if, if you could, uh, youth group, all the youth kids, if you could uh, get together, and uh, if you could get together and uh, and head out to the, uh, the high school and middle school rooms with your teachers. I'm sorry, I can't teach you today. I'm going to be here with the group. While they're doing that, let me mention, mention to you, you know there is uh, 1,440 minutes in a day. Did you know that? 
1,440. Now, that's a lot of minutes. Do you have 10 minutes for God? Yeah, you can't, you can't argue with that. 1,440 minutes. Now, my suggestion is really to get up early in the morning. Get up in the morning and get your mind right. Not only do you have to get into the scriptures to get your mind right, but also you need to, to learn patience because not everybody is going to be walking in the Word that day. You're going to meet me. I was uh, teaching youth group last night, and I, uh, I don't have much of a voice. All right, that's going to hurt. All right, so, so when, you, when you're uh, thinking about your day, plan it out, schedule it out. You have your smartphones. You can put in a schedule, and you can stick to that schedule. You know, every morning I get up early. My wife goes, I don't know how you do that every single morning. And some mornings, I don't know how I do it either, because, but it's become a habit um, to deny yourself that sleep, to pursue something greater. Take the time so that your day doesn't just become good. Your day becomes great because there's people that you're going to pass every day in your life that you're going to need to reach out to with compassion. You're going to need to be patient with. You're going to need to help guide. You're going to need to help strengthen. You're going to need to help encourage. There's a lot of folks that need some encouragement out there. And they're going to remember and, and also to watching and see what you do. And it's going to make a big difference because they're going to begin to see the unfamiliar in the familiar. Right? They're going to be able to see Christ and his light shining through you like a mighty lighthouse. And you're different. I've heard, uh, I was working with one company and uh, uh, we, we did every couple of years because it was a very, very uh, busy high tech business. The, we would switch uh, direct reports. And this one direct report said to me, that the reason I chose you is because you were a man of integrity. That was pretty cool. I thought it, she, she chose me because I was number five among 880 in the country that did my job, but she, she, she didn't say that. She didn't say that. She said, I chose you because you were a man of integrity. Now, that means a, a lot in a big corporation that people are noticing, aren't they? People are noticing how you operate every single day, and they are learning about God through you. So if there's 100 Christians, and I've said this before to the youth group, that 99 of them are going to study you, and one's going to open the Bible. What are the 99 seeing? Are they seeing God? Or are you turning people away from God because the way that your life is as a professing Christian? That could be the worst of all possible scenarios. So we really need to think about that. There's a lot, there's a lot resting on this, and there's only one lifetime to get it right. All right. So what I'm, I'm going to have you guys do here is I'm going to have you turn into groups, and I'd like you to pray with one another. I'd like you to be able to seek the Lord in a deeper way, to, to try to get refocused, to try to get this being the next day of the rest of your life. So if you could turn in uh, to, in small groups, maybe three to four tops, and pray together. We're going to close out that way, and then we're going to move the furniture for, for lunch today. All right? So I'll, I'll tell you guys when we're ready to move the furniture. But uh, go ahead and get into groups of about uh, three to four. Thank you. God bless you.